Good evening. This is certainly a new experience for us as, as we are broadcasting um, our service for tonight. God in Isaiah chapter 43 says, Forget the former things, and behold, I am doing something new. In the midst of this uncertain time, we have confidence that God continually surprises us with how he brings us his gifts of grace through his son Jesus Christ. And we are new creations in him. And so even as we hear the word tonight from our homes, we are still gathering around the word of our Lord Jesus. Tonight we continue our sermon series in our Lenten midweek services as we continue with Jesus' messages to the seven churches. And tonight we hear Jesus' message to the church in Theotira. We begin with our opening hymn, number 435 in LSB, Come to Calvary's Holy Mountain. Against you, Lord, 
Have we sinned and done evil in your sight? You are justified justified in your judgment upon me. Remove my sin, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be white as snow. By your Spirit, create in me a new and clean heart, so I may again hear the sounds of joy and gladness. According to this, your confession of sin, hear the good news. Almighty God in his mercy has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and rise again, to be the sacrifice of sin, and to be your new and greater Paschal Lamb, to redeem you from sin, death, and the devil. As an ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I thereby announce to you that you are forgiven all of your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with our hymn of thanks and praise, LSB number 806, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. perseverance, and that you are now doing more than what you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling, so I will cast her on a bed of suffering." and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Theotira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our sermon hymn, LSB number 421, 
Jesus, grant that balm and healing. Oh, my God. 
Tonight we have the revealing words of Jesus concerning something which is frightfully all too prevalent in the church. It's so prevalent that it doesn't just occupy one of Christ's letters to the seven churches, but two we heard back in Pergamum last week, something that is very similar to what we hear tonight. What Jesus' words reveal is that it is all too much an easy thing for Christians to give in and to accommodate to the ways of the world by allowing it to infiltrate our congregations. In essence, it's the opposite problem which the church of Ephesus had been diagnosed with by Jesus' words, as they were too concerned with doctrinal purity. But it's also not the problem of being willing to stand up for the faith which was Smyrna's great victory. Jesus' message begins not with outright condemnation, but with sincere commendation. He writes to the church at Theotira, I know your works, your love, and your faith, and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. This church is truly commended by Jesus by their ability to, at least the majority of them, to keep the faith and performing true acts of Christian love, which come from a true faith. Unlike the church of Ephesus, this congregation did not have an introverted faith. They were not, in other words, thinking only of how to maintain their doctrinal purity. They did not forget that it is in the very nature of being the church of God that they are to witness to the world just exactly who Jesus is, and therefore who God is in his love and mercy and forgiveness. As we've seen in other letters, this is not an easy thing to do in the face of so much persecution, whether coming from Rome or from Jewish communities. It's certainly not any different in Theatira, Jesus says. Theatira had a hard time because it was the seat of many, many guild trade groups. These were groups such as the potters and the blacksmiths who would gather together in their businesses and devote whole groups to the prayer and the religious service of foreign deities or or other deities, almost like guardian angels. Unlike today, where businesses are secular in nature, back then it included the worship of many gods and the pressures of participating in these religious services. It meant participating in pagan sacrificial system and eating food sacrificed to idols. For many Christians who were part of of trades such as these, it would have been very difficult to maintain and persevere in a faith which stayed true to Jesus. At this point, we should begin to ask ourselves, well, if Jesus is commending them for confessing their faith and acting with Christian love to those outside the faith, what is the problem? What could they be doing wrong? Well, we must always remember that the world and Satan don't always attack the church through the forms of threats and accusations which come at the church from the outside. Even more diabolical is the temptation that comes in the form of enticement and accommodation from within. It is these temptations which, according to Jesus, come with tolerating the teachings of the prophetess Jezebel. Now, the mention of the name Jezebel should be a clue to us about what is going on. Jezebel was that infamous queen of Israel in the Old Testament who brought hundreds and hundreds of false prophets of the Baals, the false gods, in order to entice Israel away from the worship and the trust of Yahweh. She was the one who brought her harlotries and sorceries, as 2 Kings tells us. 
She was enticing the people to turn away from God. For there to be one that Jesus names a Jezebel in their midst means that this prophetess was one that was supposedly tempting God's people to accommodate, to turn in perhaps subtle ways to those false gods through sexual immorality and food sacrifice to idols. What all this means is that Theatira, while officially standing up their faith in Christ against the pagan environment around, were actually becoming like the world around them by tolerating this enticement by this group from within its own congregation. We can think of today's prosperity gospel preachers that try to entice Christians to think not of what Christ promises through his cross, but what the world offers in the temptations that come from that. People who try to share the word of God as if it were trying to get us to be concerned about those worldly things rather than following Jesus. This can happen through the temptations of prosperity and wealth, as I'm sure was happening in those trade guilds, as people were concerned more about their businesses and accumulating wealth, subtly giving their hearts over to business rather than their Lord. But it could also happen by by what they do with their bodies. That's why Jesus also refers to sexual immorality. This isn't to say that Jesus thinks that human sexuality is evil or something to be ashamed of in its proper context. But what Jesus is revealing here in his word is the trap that we could ever separate our true spirituality, our true selves, from what we do in our bodies and where we make our priorities in our outward public lives. What we do with our persons reveal what is going on in our hearts. There is no true Christian faith which says, oh, well, I can be sexually active outside of marriage, or I can engage in this or that activity, or I can give my heart over to this worldly concern, even though I know God says it is sinful. I can do all of that because I believe Jesus died for me. That's not what true Christian faith in Jesus says. What we do with our bodies and our persons directly influences the faith of our hearts. How does directly disobeying God's word affect such belief in Jesus? Except to erode it and to call it into question in our lives. How strong can our trust in Jesus be if our actions are blatantly going against his word. What we do physically affects even our faith for its strengthening or its demise. In C.S. Lewis's novel, The Screwtape Letters, Lewis writes from the perspective of an old demon in hell who is skilled in the art of temptation and who is writing letters to his nephew, Wormwood, in order to counsel him on tempting him out of being a Christian, tempting a man out of being a Christian. In one of the letters, Screwtape counsels his nephew, Wormwood, that if Wormwood's man, his patient, as he refers to him, is to pray at all, that he should do so all he can to distract his prayer life through physical means like refusing, getting him to refuse to bow one's head or take a reverent posture or even to speak prayers out loud. Screwtape writes, they can be persuaded that the bodily position makes no difference to their prayers, for they constantly forget what you must always remember, that they, namely us humans, are animals, and whatever they do, they do with their bodies which affects their souls. What is true on this 
subtle level of how our bodies and spirits go hand in hand is certainly true in those very open instances of immorality, whether it be through sexual activity or through drunkenness or giving into anger through physical aggressiveness, handing ourselves over to the concerns of the world rather than following our Lord Jesus can lead only to the darkest places. Our bodies matter. What we do with our lives matter, and that is that. And so our physical activities matter. God loves our bodies. He invented them. And those Christians in Theotira were being taught that those things don't matter. That they can be concerned for the world and their own physical pleasures. And that it didn't matter with their faith. They were told they could have it both ways. They could, be, they could believe one way and live in another way. These are also our temptations in our culture today. We are always being fed a message one way or another, whether it be through the media, through Netflix, through the friends that we keep, through those false prophets that we tolerate. And so we cannot fool ourselves into thinking that we can separate our worship life, our life of faith, and the life of our public existence. We cannot be privately spiritual and openly pagan. It just doesn't work like that. And Jesus gives his word of judgment that for those who continue in this way, he will bring his judgment and there will be death, spiritual death. As I'm sure you can understand, those who give themselves over to the world little by little will soon find that that faith is gone for good. Because the fact of the matter is, we become what we worship, and what we value most, where our priorities are, demonstrate what we worship. If we worship dead and lifeless things, then soon we will become dead and lifeless in our hearts and in our spirits. But there's hope and there's good news. Jesus shows us even in himself how much our whole lives matter to him. Because Jesus, the Son of God, has become for us our incarnate Lord, not just spirit, but truly human in all of the physical and spiritual dimensions of our life. He took on what is truly ours so that he could heal it from the inside out. That's what the cross and the resurrection are about. God caring so much for our whole lives as human creatures that he's willing to take it all on to himself, to heal it, to forgive as he dies upon the cross for us, as he redeems us from those duplicitous ways where we serve God with one side of our mouth but serve our own hearts through the other. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we see the Son of God in all his glory the one with the flaming sight, the one with bronze legs as if burnished in a furnace. Jesus, who takes on all that we are, we are given a new life with God through him. And that's what he promises, as we who cling to him in faith, as we trust him to walk with him, to follow him and obey. He promises to give us the morning star himself. And he promises to give us the rod to share his own reign and rule with us, that which smashes all of the opposition. A fitting image for those who are, make their living through making pottery, as you might imagine. Jesus is the Lord of the world, and so we call upon him in faith, and we listen to his living word, which strengthens us in our time 
as we wait for him to come again. In Jesus' name, amen. We now continue with prayer. Heavenly Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have showed us that you truly are the Lord of the world. As Jesus himself declares in his resurrection, all authority of heaven and on earth has been given to me. We know that your reign is solidified through the work of Jesus and his death and his resurrection on the cross. And may we always pray for this reign and rule to be made manifest in our lives through the work of your Holy Spirit and as we cling to your Son, Jesus Christ, in faith. May we always trust in you wholeheartedly. And where we stumble, forgive us our sins that we may constantly follow you. We ask for the strength and the faith not to accommodate ourselves to the pressures of the world, even as we are in the world, but not of it. Lord, we ask that you, as the Lord of all creation, would continue to be with our country, with our world, for all of those suffering from the coronavirus pandemic that you would be with all health work care workers, that you would be with all government officials and authorities as they aim to make the best and wisest decisions through the wisdom that you give to us in creation. May we, as your church, continue to pray for those in positions of authority, that they may depend upon you and your counsel and your word and your wisdom. May we learn to obey when the gospel is not at stake or attacked, but that we may show our love for our neighbors in our citizenship, which puts our neighbors before ourselves. Lord, we ask for healing in our own midst, in our own congregation, for Jack and Nancy Harvey, for Logan Hendricks, for Patty Jobson, for Anna Johnson, for Fern Johnson, for Ray Jones, for Michelle Crucial, for Yoshiko Langer, for Mike Lansky, for Sharon Myers, for Anna Novotny, for Cheryl Pierce, for Joe Schuler, for Dick and Gloria Stenland, for Wanda Taylor, and for Sharon Woodard. We ask that for those who are ailing in body or soul, that you would continue to comfort them through the promises in your Son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Trusting in our Lord Jesus and as his disciples, we are bold to pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Watch, Watch over us, O creator of heaven and earth. Save us, Lord, waking and guard us sleeping, that awake we may serve you and sleeping we may rest in peace. Lord, now let us depart in peace according to your word, for we have seen your salvation prepared for all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. We now pray Luther's evening prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. 
for into your hands I commend myself, body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. We now conclude with our closing hymn. Hymn number 880 in LSB. Now rests beneath night's shadow.